Coming to you from the not-for-profit Mainframe Studios at 900 Keough Way in downtown Des Moines, this is 900 Views, a podcast about building community through the arts as we build an arts community. Welcome to Episode 2. I'm your host, Pat Bodie. Our first guest was Mainframe's Executive Director, Siobhan Spain, and this time we visit with clay figure artist Linda Lewis, who's one of those nationally recognized creatives calling Mainframe their professional home. Linda describes her work as sculptures that speak, and they do seem to do just that. In this interview, you'll learn about one piece in particular, likely pictured where you found the link to this podcast. I referenced the piece in this interview as The Light, but the actual title is It Is Our Light. And as Linda describes it, for those of you not seeing the picture, just remember she's talking about a seated clay figure with left foot tucked under and holding a right bent knee. She also references a poem by Marianne Williamson. I'll guide you to that poem before this podcast is over. One final note, Linda Lewis comes to her artistic work as a second career after decades as a teacher librarian. Linda Lewis. After 30 some years of being a teacher, I, I saw the opportunity that I could retire early. So I, I started preparing myself. So I started working in clay because I hadn't had a chance to do that in my undergrad. Um, yeah, why clay? Um, well, it was one of those things that, you know, I went to school in the 70s and you wanted to take clay because that was a big deal to be able to throw pots and whatever. But there was never any room in the classes. So so I thought, oh, well, I could take a class at the Arts Center. And um, they had an arrangement with Dahlquist Clay Works that you could take it there. And so in the evening after I um, uh, stopped teaching or were, was done with um, working, I could go down and work some more. So it wasn't just I went to the class. I could work there. And I could go on weekends and work all weekend if I wanted to. Now, what made you think originally that you couldn't make a living as an artist? Well, I came from a culture that, you know, my parents hadn't gone to college. A lot of my aunts had gone to college but had become teachers. And so I didn't know what the possibilities were. I had not I had no idea. If I would have known that I could go into architecture, I would have gone into architecture, but I had no idea that someone actually had a job like that. And it was just so narrow, I guess, what what I thought the possibilities were. So, um, and I, you know, I worked in a, a mostly an industrial farming area in Michigan, and um, those things just weren't very talked about. And and one of my, a couple of my professors um, at the small college I went to, uh, Graceland, in Iowa, they in Lamoni. Did, yes, uh huh. They talked to me and said, "You really should be majoring in this." But I thought, "What? What? How would I? How would I pay my school loans back?" So, <laughs> <laughs> so what are you finding now that you're actually an uh, an artist, a professional artist? How's it working out from the standpoint of actually making a living? I realize you have a retirement, but um, if you were to subtract that <laughs> from from your day to day, would would you be doing all right? Uh, no, I don't. I I think it would be hard to, especially you get used to a certain standard of living, and my uh, sometimes my teacher friends will go. It's so exciting! You got to do something else, <laughs> kind of thing. <laughs> and you know, some of my pieces people would say were kind of pricey but you know they don't sell regularly kind of thing right so it's one of those things you you know it it takes a van to haul things places and it takes it takes money to be able to do it and so no I always tell people well I might be living out of a car if I didn't have another source of income some other source of income so from your perspective, as, as someone who's had two careers, uh-huh. how, how do you see the arts becoming more of an actual career choice that someone could make and, and actually be successful at it? Have, have you got any ideas related to that? When we think about trying to uh, build an arts community in Des Moines, uh, in central Iowa, and then beyond into the Midwest, how does that happen? How do we make that happen? 
You know, I, I, I don't know that I have a good perception of how that could happen. I mean, I, I, I like to think that it could happen. And I'm kind of a, I'm sort of a person that needs to make sure that, you know, and I knew that coming out of college, I needed to have a paycheck at the end of the, I, I do not do well when I have to worry about money kind of thing. So, you know, I, I know that I'm probably more careful than most people are, but um, I think it's very possible for people to get in an art field and still make art at the same time if they're afraid that maybe they wouldn't make enough, especially initially, off their own art. And I think it is kind of tricky when you live in an area that's, you know, Midwest, where you know, there aren't many art galleries, and I don't know that, you know, you find the same kind of buying crowd here, and th and that's why I go to art festivals, because I can go to larger cities, and that's kind of how I've been picked up by galleries, is because of that, so, uh, and you, you widen your, your audience, <laughs> so, um, you know, I think that would be better ask of someone else who has a <laughs> well. I think good you gave me a good, a, a good, in, an interesting answer. Do Do you use uh, social media? Yes, I use some, but when you when I have to do it all, like I have to make the stuff, <laughs> to, sometimes I don't update my website very regularly. I mean, I think that's a real, and then you know, I do all my own accounting and that sort of thing. Um, sometimes I just feel like I know there's probably a better way to do it, but I don't, and I'm not, and I think this is probably typical of most artists. We are not very good self-promoters. I mean, something about putting my stuff out there on social media all the time seems like it gets tiresome. Yeah, fair, fair <laughs> or I see other people doing it and I think, oh, hey, look at that, but I don't see myself doing it I don't know if it's my personality or whatever but well your work is absolutely stunning and I've certainly enjoyed your class when I took it I, I wanted to speak uh, a little bit uh, with you about a piece uh, that is off to my right here and um, I would like to have you uh, describe it it's called the light and uh, I could make an effort at description but it might be better coming from you well um, it was um, inspired by the poem by Mariana Williamson, um, and Nelson Mandela is often attributed to writing it, but actually he quoted it in one of his speeches, and that's, I think, what it made it become <clears throat> more well-known. But it's a, a sitting piece, and it's probably about 32 inches tall, maybe, and... Um, uh, on one side, there's like rays of light and color coming out that spreads down to the knee. And on the other side, it has part of that poem scratched in it. And the, the reason that it touched me is because um, I do think a lot of my work has to do with what what people are thinking about, what they're really like, and that they they may have this exterior, but you know, I just find it interesting, and probably you as an interviewer, too. You're trying to find out who that person really is, kind of, when you interview them. So if you translate that to if you want to do a piece of art about that, how, how do you portray something like that? So that's always kind of caught my imagination of how do you represent what people are really like. And um, anyway, this poem... Uh, just, I don't know, there's something, because it talks about that our deepest fears that we were, they, they say our deepest fears were powerful beyond measure, but most people, the fear keeps them from doing things, keeps them from changing, and keeps them from trying new things. And then it talks about when we're liberated from our own fear, then we automatically liberate others. And so... So it has, oh, some symbolic scratching on it and that kind of thing. But that's kind of what it's supposed to represent as this poem about, you know, going forward, doing something, not being fearful. 
Well, that's one of the things I would have kind of observed about you is that you strike me as someone who's not particularly fearful and has, in fact, gone forward with something that a lot of folks might have hesitated to do. And yet, at the same time, it's something you did as a second career because you had your hesitations yeah, uh, early yeah. on. Is, yeah. is that why this particular poem resonates so oh, strongly for you? Oh, I, I think so, yeah. Because I had to really calculate, do I really want to do that? What if this happens? Because I didn't, you know, everybody wants to be able to support themselves. And, to you know, and, and my husband had a, was working at the time, so I knew he could support us. But still, I know I had this thing in my brain that I have to contribute, I have to bring to the table. So I was very hesitant about, probably because I'm very cautious financially about things. Um, and then I just thought, what's the worst that could happen, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and I really loved teaching. That was the other thing. I really liked that part of my life. Um, but I also thought this is something that I thought I never have the chance to do, and now I have a chance. So why not do it? Our kids were grown, and and I thought also it shows our our kids that sometimes you have to be brave and do something. Um, you know, be able to support yourself, but also you have to sometimes take a risk. So anyway. How, how, how has your family responded? Um, they, uh, they, they are very supportive. They don't really, like if they go in my studio, they don't say, oh, I really like that. They don't do that sort of thing. But if I need someone to help me <laughs> go to a go to a art festival and set up, which is really hard work, and take down and whatever, they go, okay, I'll help you. So, and that sort of thing. And my husband has always been very supportive. Has never said, why did you quit your other... He's never done that. So, and he's... And he'll come into the studio, and I think they see it as a part of me. It's not like anything particularly... And I think when they... When they're with me, and people come in and make nice comments about my I work, I think they have a new respect for <laughs> what the mother does. <laughs> Because I think at first they just thought, we've seen the birthday cakes you've made for us, and they were awful. <laughs> okay, Mom, <laughs> you think you can do this? <laughs> what, what was your first work that you, that you had some sense of pride about, if, if, if pride is a fair word to um, use? When I started doing this or when I was a kid? Well, I guess I was thinking about it as an adult here. Oh, but, uh, oh, but I'm interested oh. either in either, I well, guess. I had tried some more. I was very inspired by Henry Moore. And so when I started working in clay, people were working on the wheel, and I thought, I oh, know, I do not want to do that. I mean, I learned how to do it, but I was lousy. And I thought, I really, I don't know if I just want to make pots in my life. And so I thought, well, I'm going to start making like very representational. Her hands Figures. are really flying here, folks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Figures. And so I kind of did that, and oh my gosh, I should have taken pictures of the first ones I made. They were awful. So I did a couple of those, and then I took a workshop. Um, we happened to be in Santa Fe. Santa Fe Clay has workshops during the summer from potter, or like well-known potters will teach a class for a week, or in this case, there, there was a figurative artist, and I saw that she was teaching a class, and uh, my husband said, why don't you take that? And I thought, oh, I don't know. I see that fear comes in. Oh, I, uh, I'm not a, or I don't know how to make figures. I don't know what I, don't, I don't do that for. So I know when people come to my class and they've never done it before, I know the exact feeling that they're feeling. But anyway, as Deborah Fritz taught this class, so I did go. And at the end, it was like my my piece looked like a person. <laughs> I was like <laughs> amazed. <laughs> Not only that, but she said, oh, you've done this before. And I went, no, it was the first time I've ever done this. And she said, you should be doing this. And sometimes I think there's a, another person that's not your family member. <laughs> that there's kinda, a validation. Yeah, can kind of encourage you to do something that maybe... Because, you know, your family loves you. You're supposed to like what you do. But <laughs> so, so what's ahead for you uh, 
as an artist, as a professional artist, what's next? Um, <clears throat> well, I guess I just really concentrate on the on the work, um, trying to um, to have an idea and trying to represent it, and then be able to carry out the actual making of it still continues to really um, just challenge me. I don't know. It just There's something about that. I've always liked to make things, and this is like something that is difficult, yet it is very doable to learn how to do. And um, I, I have recently been working with uh, making um, um, clay hinges so that you can open up the head and see what they're thinking. And yeah, I love that. I was going to mention, <laughs> uh, you, you take off a lid of a head, <laughs> and inside there's a robin's nest in one of these. Uh, so what was going on in your head when you put a robin's nest in some clay figure's head? Well, I was just thinking, uh, people always ask me where I get my ideas, and I, I, I always imagine... I have these little eggs up there with ideas in them that are just waiting to hatch at the right time. So that's why the robins egg. So usually I say the title something like hatching some new ideas or something like that. But, you know, it's just those little nuggets. That, and, and, and some of them I have little golden nuggets that I've put gold leaf on and they're in there. And it's like these little golden nuggets. And I know other people have them too um, that, you know, just at the right time something something ignites ignites it and off they go it's a little doing bit back something. to the poem essentially yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah is there a line or two you uh, of that poem that you would like to read as we as we close um well it says i i've never looked at the light i like the idea of the light that we each of us have light and so when i you know when i was working with kids and then my husband, what, what really had an influence on in my life is that my husband and I adopted um, four kids who were in early elementary school when we got them. And what struck me is that they each had this light. And even though they'd had maybe not so hot experiences, they, they still held this, uh, I don't know, it just really affected me as a person that they had this light in them. And so it makes you look at other people differently, too. Like, what is that light in them? What makes them who they are? Or where is that, you know, I don't want to be trite and say goodness, but that, um, yeah, kind of goodness in everybody. And so it says that it says that it is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. And that when we smi play small, it does not serve the world. And I thought, you know, sometimes, and I, I tend to, sh I don't like a lot of attention usually. And um, sometimes I just have to be brave and kind of do things, you know. So the last line, as we are liberated from our fear, our presence automatically liberates others. And so that it has a, a rippling effect, I suppose, to to others and I hope that it does that to our children and grandchildren but also you know to other people that it kind of spreads you know so. well I think part of the point of this podcast is to talk about as we say uh, building community through the arts while building the arts community and it would be a fair assessment to say that you are uh, doing both quite Aww. well here from your beautiful studio at Mainframe and so with that I want to thank you very much for taking the time to visit with me well thank you it was a pleasure I promised information about Marianne Williamson's poem, Our Greatest Fear, that served as Lewis's inspiration. I found the poem at both explorersfoundation.org and poemhunter.com. It's from Williamson's 1992 bestseller, Return to Love. We'd like to also mention upcoming events of note. February 21, Mainframe launches Third Thursday Happy Hour from 5 to 7 p.m. with comedian Sid Jaworker. Tangerine Food Company mixes a unique cocktail plus wine, beer, and other refreshments. No cover, just a lot of fun, creative mingling, and I hope I pronounced Sid's last name correctly. On Friday, March 1, 
Mainframe hosts Bring It Home, an art and interiors showcase. This special First Friday show brings interior designers together with home good retailers, furniture makers, and artists, of course, for an exciting evening focused on living with art. What a great concept. Get ideas to reinvent your home office, living room, dining spaces, and more. It's free, open to the public, and a lot of fun. And never forget to explore those artist studios on the top floor. As an art mom, I always have to mention that. Soon we'll post episode three with Drake Art Prof and amazing baker to boot, Benjamin Gardner. Meanwhile, stay safe, stay warm. Let's keep enriching our community by supporting these creative talents. I'm Beth Bodie. Please share www.900views.com with friends. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.